All right, I believe we're going to, we've hit a somewhat critical mass. I'm sure more people are going to be trickling in. So I'll just get started for now. Hi, everyone. My name is Kara, and I'm one of the graduate co-chairs for the Southeast Asian Graduate Program at Cornell. I'm joined by Anna, who is our under uh, wonderful co-chair. Yes, she is waving to all of us. And this is the eighth lecture of the spring 2021 uh, Gaddy Lecture Series. And the Gaddy Lecture Series are a weekly lecture series featuring advanced uh, Southeast Asian graduate students, as well as academics, diplomats, researchers, and others who have expertise in Southeast Asia. And before I get into Professor Douglas's talk and bio, I'm going to give a very brief outline of how we conduct these talks and then we can get started. So usually it's about 45 minutes of lecture, usually in, uninterrupted. If you have a brilliant question that you just can't wait to ask, please put it in the chat uh, during the lecture. And then we're gonna move into the official question and answer period. And during this period, we want it to be as interactive as possible. I know we're probably all Zoom tired, but we encourage you to uh, raise your hand and then we'll call on you. If you really don't want to, feel free to also put your questions in the chat and then me and Anna will field them. And with that, uh, I will take it to Professor Douglas's bio and then we can get started. So Gavin Douglas holds a bachelor's of music and a bachelor's of art degree from Queens University and a master's of music from the University of Texas, as well as a PhD from the University of Washington. He is currently a professor of ethnomusicology in the School of Music and adjunct professor of anthropology at UNC Greensboro. He is the author of Music in Mainland Southeast Asia, a text that explores diversity, political trauma, and globalization across Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. His other writings can be found in a variety of journals and edited volumes on topics such as state patronage of the arts, music and politics, ethnic minority traditions, and the sound worlds of Theravada Buddhism. He is also an active guitarist, fiddle player, and Irish flutist. And with that, I take it over to you, Gavin. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing a couple of familiar names in the uh, in the room. So um, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Really happy to see some familiar faces or at least some familiar names. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. I'm truly honored. I really wish I were there in person to meet with all of you, but maybe in a few years again, um, we're making do. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Ronald and Janet Gaddy Lecture Series, and in particular, um, uh, Anna and Cara for their generous hosting, digital as it is. Um, so let, yeah, let me share my screen and we can get rolling on things. All right. So what I'd like to discuss today are some thoughts on the relationship between Buddhism and sound. I'll begin by recounting some of the debates about music and sound with regard to Buddhism, some from the ancient literature and some from contemporary monks. Follow that with some examples that might confuse our categories. And I'll end with some reflections on the use of Buddhist sound in the current political demonstrations, moving thus from doctrine to practice to the political. Buddhist monasteries and pagodas in Myanmar are acoustically rich places that contain a wide variety of layered bells, gongs, chants, and prayers, sculpting the sonic environment. Buddhist activity among the non-ordained laity is also full of sounds and songs that support the distribution of and the meditation on the Dhamma, the Buddhist teachings. Throughout both lay and monastic Buddhist practice, sounds sculpt the architecture of rituals, invoke apratapraic spells for protection or warding off evil, proclaim sutras, and mark time for daily activities, denote the acquisition and the distribution of merit, aid in the cultivation of particular states of mind, and through group sounding, create a community of practitioners. Despite the rich sound world, the musicology of Theravada Buddhism is still in its infancy. By far the lion's share of ethnomusicological work on Buddhism is found among the Northern Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions. The Theravada musical world has been largely ignored with few notable but small exceptions by Miller, Sykes, Green, and Schwarakal. The Grove Dictionary of Music for example, the first stop for graduate students beginning research in music, does not mention the Theravada tradition at all. 
and mentions Thai chant only in passing. Similarly, recent appeals by Hirschkind and Engelhardt and Lake to increase the dialogue between music studies and religious studies barely mentions Buddhism, and they don't mention Theravada Buddhism at all. I gesture here to draw more attention to Buddhist theory and practice for studies of music, and also to the reveal the importance of music and sound more broadly to the study of Buddhism. For students of Theravada Buddhism, this will highlight the significant and largely unacknowledged role that sculpted sound plays in Buddhist practice. And for music scholars, it will highlight sonic realms that have heretofore had little scholarly attention. This sound world is immense, and what I offer here are only preliminary observations and questions. The ontology of music, what music is, seems to be a primary concern here in the quest to parse the productive uses of sound from the distracting, the sanctioned from the restricted. This is to say, that is to say, what is music and under what circumstances is a sound regarded as music or not music? And relatedly, what sorts of sound producing behaviors are appropriate to Buddhist practice and what are not? And more importantly, why? There we go. One conundrum to be confronted in the study of music in the Theravada world is the seventh Buddhist precept that restricts engagement with music. Indeed, how can we speak of the musicology of Buddhism if Buddhists are not able to participate? The seventh precept is expected of all monks and devout laity. Many Buddhists adhere to the first five precepts that speak against killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and intoxicants. A further, further three are added for the devout laity who at particular times in the lunar cycle, and I'll speak more to that later, are expected to observe periods of intense meditation. In the Myanmar context, the Waso full moon of Lent and Ubone, the time of the week that people go to the monastery or the temple and devote more time to religious practice. The number of precepts taken is usually a major index of the religious status of an individual. Theravada Buddhism is known for its comparatively strict adherence to the Pali Canon for guidance. Throughout the suttas, the ostensible word of the Buddha, words of the Buddha, there are multiple references that reflect the Buddha's concern with sensuous things. Discussion of music often point to the Gitasara Sutta and the Buddha's words on recitation of the Dhamma. There are bhikkhus, these five drawbacks of reciting the Dhamma with a sustained melodic intonation. So he's not even talking about music here. He's talking about simply how to recite the Dhamma. One gets attached to the intonation. Others get attached to the intonation. Householders get angry. There's a break in concentration for those striving to produce musicality and the upcoming generations imitate what they see. These are the drawbacks of reciting the Dhamma. These concerns regarding music and recitation point to the qualities of attraction, of sensuousness, and music's ability to draw one into attachment. Both the suttas of the Pali Buddhist canon and the Jataka tales, the stories of the Buddhist previous lives, which are source material for both the suttas and countless artistic traditions, provide copious material for rich debate on the issues. There are multiple references to music in the Pali Suttas and in the Jataka tales to which people appeal in such debates. Lay Buddhist musicians with whom I raised this question in Myanmar were quick to highlight the Jataka tale number 243 that tells how the Buddha in a previous life had lived as an eminent musician playing the arched harp at the court of Benares. This particular Jataka tale is well known among traditional musicians who personally identify with its intersection of music and Buddhism. The terminology on pitch and off, sama and visama, is used in Pali scriptures to describe the moral quality of people and actions. From the Muni Sutta, we read, pondering what is on pitch and off, the enlightened call him a sage. And from the Sona Sutta, is, um, 
is uh, we are taught to calibrate uh, the S Sona, the the main character, is taught to calibrate his practice like a lute, not too aggressive and not too lazy. The contemplative, the sage or the monk, is in tune like a lute with what is proper and appropriate, not too tight and not too loose. Some scholars source, scholarly sources point to the Buddha as an accomplished harpist. Others recall that it was the sound of the harp that tempted the Bodhisattva in the moments before his enlightenment. In Myanmar specifically, the arched harp, or the Songak, is so tightly associated with Buddhism, it is reported that such associations are largely responsible for the survival of the harp during colonization and modernization of the country over the past 150 years. And note here the, the Buddhist iconography of the headstock that has a leaf uh, uh, shaped from the Bodhi tree such that anybody who plays the Burmese harp is figuratively sitting underneath the Bodhi tree where the Buddha attained enlightenment. Other contextual stories complicate things further. In the Mahabharata Sutta, we note the musical circumstances around the Buddha's death. On arrival, they spent the entire day in worshiping, honoring, respecting, and venerated the Blessed One's body with dances, songs, music, garlands, and scents, all of these sensual things. It's too late to cremate the Blessed One's body. We'll do it tomorrow. And so they spent the second, third, fourth, fifth day Sixth day, worshiping, honoring, respecting, and venerating the body with dances, songs, music, garlands. Heavenly music was playing in the sky in homage to the Tathagata. Venerable Una Nayaka, Ashin Dr. Ataba, and Sayada Unandawanta are three ab abbots who provide different perspectives on the role of music in Buddhism. There are different opinions seem as much rooted in the practicalities of the communities that they serve as they are in scriptural orthodoxy. Each recognizes that the laity have different spiritual needs that might be served or disserved by music, and the Buddhist path is not the same for all. Sayada Unayaka is the head of the Pangda'u monastic school in Northeast Mandalay. This school provides free education to over 7,000 underprivileged children of Mandalay. Yes, a school with 7,000 students. In a conversation with him during the summer of 2014 about Dhamma songs composed and performed by the laity, he asserted that it encourages participation in Dhamma and facilitates engagement and education of the often esoteric scriptures. Unayaka sees the Dhamma songs as a positive and exciting thing. Dhamma music provides opportunities for communities to gather and discuss and also to, to distribute the teachings of the Buddha in a novel way. Music is not a problem. For the laity, it encourages participation in the Dhamma. Sayada Unayaka's thoughts on Dhamma groups, on distribution of the message, and most of all, his lifelong commitment to educating children in poverty reveal his commitment to a socially engaged Buddhism. His concerns for worldly education of kids in contra is contrasted with many monks and monasteries that distance themselves from the mundane world and devote their time to understanding the Pali scriptures and meditation practice. Ashin Dr. Asaba, head of the Shui Wawin Meditation Center in Dagon, provides a contrasting perspective. Dr. Asaba, is a highly acclaimed teacher of meditation and his perspectives are noticeably different. Dhamma Gita, he relays, may well bring people to community and greater participation in the Dhamma, but ultimately it is a false road to the truth. You might feel happy when singing, but that is not real happiness. Such enjoyment, as with any enjoyment that is based on attachment, is fleeting and impermanent. Dhamma Gita is a thorn for our Dhamma, it contributes to craving which leads to attachment. It may be enjoyable in the mundane world, but such does not lead to true happiness. Even when I give Dhamma talks, I must be careful of elongating my speech and becoming attached to the sound. To think that my talk is good, or the sound of my voice is beautiful, or I like the sound of my speech and the response I perceive from the listeners is all very dangerous. 
The focus shifts to I or to the sound or to other things external to the message, things that are external and fleeting. Similarly, for the audience listener who enjoys the sound and becoming attached is fooled. True happiness and true knowledge are found through understanding the process of mind and metta, loving kindness. Only this will reveal things as they really are. Meditation groups that use music as a background to their meditation or perform for entertainments defile the Dhamma. They reduce their meditation practice to the mundane. While such statements appear extreme, Ashin Dr. Athaba recognizes that such dispositions towards external attachments, such as sound and self, are normal in the mundane day-to-day -day world and relays the above in a kind and compassionate manner and regularly invites musicians into the monastery to play for the community, but not for the monks or those engaged in meditation. Sayada Unandawanta is abbot of the Dhammavima Monastery in Jamestown, North Carolina. His solo station in the hinterlands of the American Burmese Buddhist diaspora offers another perspective. When I ask him about the seventh precept, he playfully comments on the more melodic versions of the suttas found in Thailand and in Laos and in Sri Lanka, as if to imply that, that the traditions in those countries have strayed. In actuality, Nandawanta, who is the sole monk serving a small community of about 50 immigrant families, as a community center, we have lots of music here at the monastery. He's somewhat more indifferent on the debates and highlights that it is really only relevant during times of intense religious commitment, while ordained as a monk or during periods of deliberate intensive practice during full moon festivals. He is quick to link them with the sixth and the eighth precepts, eating afternoon and sleeping on an elevated or luxurious bed, which when combined with the seventh serve to critique our attachments to sensuality. Each of these monks point to globalizing forces largely from outside of Myanmar to explain more flexible interpretations of the precepts, but clearly are in disagreement as to the benefit or the damage that music brings to Burmese Buddhism. For many Burmese, the boundaries between laity and the Sangha, the ordained monks, is fluid. Ordination for a time into the Sangha is expected of most Burmese Buddhist males and for many females who will enter the monastery at certain coming of age moments for a period of time. This may happen multiple times during someone's lifetime, offering for some a rather porous boundary between the monastic and the lay life. The physical space of the monastery also serves as a gathering place for the lay community. I recall during more than one stay in Mandalay, looking for a relatively quiet and affordable place to record music, my harp teacher, Umyam Mong, arranged for a recording session in his local monastery. The abbot of the monastery who enjoyed the Chinji, the classical tradition, invited us in and intermittently witnessed, heard, and enjoyed the recording session. Speaking of sound more broadly, the, ontolo the ontology of music seems to be a primary concern here in the quest to parse the productive uses of sound from the distracting. At the heart of this med mediation, Jeffers Engelhart writes, is ontological difference. The fact that a sound that might be perceived and thought of as music is decidedly not music in a secular enlightenment sense, or that the power of religious performance derives from the metaphysics of sound rather than from its sonic qualities. This is the difference between Kira'a and Musika in the Muslim world, between Fanbei and Yinwe in Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, between chanting and singing in the Catholic Church. And this difference is one of the enduring epistemological concerns and ethnographic fascinations of music scholarship. Not only did the Buddha advise his followers to avoid the distracting influences of music, evidence also suggests he was skeptical about the ontology of sound, and he had important reservations about the ways in which sounds may and may not be helpful in the pursuit of truth. The Buddha encouraged his disciples to move beyond specific sounds in their studies, contemplations, and teachings of the Dhamma. 
Perhaps this is one reason that the Broda encouraged his monks to teach the Dhamma in the languages of the localities they visited. Buddhist chant, phonological sounds are considered a means to an end rather than an end in themselves. And this is quite a contrast to say Islam's, Islam's approach to the Quran that of course needs to be in classical Arabic because that is the language that um, Muhammad received the text in. Of course, many musicians in Burma are practicing Buddhists who especially in their elder years aim to reinforce their karmic legacy, merit, and dial up their religious activity. Much like the comically virtuous act of building a pagoda or offering a child to the monastery to become a monk, there exists a small but growing trend of composing Dhamma Gita for musical offerings, composing Dhamma songs. The ritual act of giving, Dana, to the religion in essential, is essential is essential to the economy of merit. Music is not historically considered a proper offering, yet numerous high status musicians have negotiated with abbots and pushed the boundaries of what counts as an acceptable donation. The following example comes from an event recognizing the death of the Mingun Sayada and the inauguration of his statuary at the Mingun Monastery. This is across the river from Mandalay. A song cycle of 81 songs written by composer Gita Lulin Mangkoko was performed as a merit-making offering by a group of 25 Yangon-based musicians. Ukoko draws melodic material from many classical court as well as other 20th century styles, Kalaba, Kithong, and contemporary musics. As all of the participants were trained singers, they were already familiar with most of the melodies associated with each song form. The lyrics are drawn from the classical canon, the classical musical canon, as well as Buddhist sutras and original poetry. Orthodox perspectives would absolutely consider it inappropriate, absolutely inappropriate to have Buddhist sutras set to overtly musical sound. Melismatic vocalizations, acrobatic melodies, instrumental accompaniment, etc. Unlike monastic chant, these 81 Dhamma songs include instrumental accompaniment in both pre-recorded and live form, with live harp accompaniment and pre-recorded sign wang. The small cramped space inside the meditation hall offered only enough room for the musical troupe. The resident monks disappeared just before the beginning of the singing, making clear that this was a sacred event for the laity, but on monastic space. And here's a little clip from it. also add that the the idea of group singing um, only shows up in religious contexts. It's very much a soloistic tradition. Um, but this idea of Dhamma songs um, uh, has been very much on the rise, I think, in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and YouTube, as evidence of, of growing trends, is starting to get a lot more of these. Um, another example, the soundscapes of the pagoda. The ever-present sonic glitter of the pagoda landscape is more than just oral wallpaper. And I just want to give you a little sound clip of what it would be like to visit, say, the Shui Degong Pagoda in the center of Yangon. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
The ever-present sonic glitter. Amid sutras, prayers, and chants, one finds dhamma instruments, bells, gongs, percussion plaques. These are not musical instruments. These are dhamma instruments that decorate the pagodas. The long tradition of donating such furnishings to the pagoda or monastery is a gift worthy of karmic recognition. So um, you visit a, uh, a pagoda in or a monastery in, in Myanmar, you will find dozens, hundreds, thousands of gongs and bells that have all been donated. Um, here are some scenes from the entrance to the Mahamuni Pagoda in Mandalay, where we have these kiosks where you can buy musical ins or Dhamma instruments to donate. And this practice of inscribing bells with, don with uh, um, messages or Dhamma messages or um, accounts of the donors wishes and whatnot the um it's actually on bells that some of the most secure um historical records can be found you know palm leaf manuscripts rot and get eaten by termites and whatnot but the inscriptions on bells um are pretty are pretty common um uh indeed the inscriptions in uh, on bells, recognizing donors, dates, and events are an invaluable source of Buddhist and pagoda history. Uh, while given as karmic generating offerings, earning merit for the donors, they are struck most often to signal an offering or a prayer and a donation. Oh, this is the uh, the big bell that um, King Bodhpaya had built in the early 1800s, um, not only as a donation, to earn karmic merit, um, but also, of course, a symbol of his own power. And this bill, bell is, I think, the second largest gong in the in the world still today. And you can take a boat across from Mandalay and go bring it yourself. Um, these bells are struck most often as a signal of an offering or a prayer or donation. When one earns karmic merit from a donation, a prayer, an offering, ideally something that is shared with others. Striking the bell at your home shrine or in the village pagoda is metta. It is a gesture of loving kindness. So you earn some karmic, karmic merit, you make some prayers, you make a donation, and then you strike the bell. And by striking the bell, you are um, sending out that karma that you have earned out to the world. Um, because in for karma to be truly uh, enjoyed or truly granted, you should share it. On the other side of that, when you are listening and hearing, well, here's an, here's another picture. Um, in any donation site or any um, monastery, there will be many, many bells, many, many gongs, or this thing, little GZ percussion plaque here that will be struck to acknowledge the merit, the karmic merit that has been made. On the receiving end, if you're not the one making the donation, but you are hearing the donation, you are essentially being invited in the sort of um, Pali sense of mudita, which is sympathetic joy. You are being invited to participate in somebody else's karmic merit. So these bells are both the sounding of somebody's merit making the loving kindness that they are wanting to share with the rest of the world with the merit they have just made. And on the receiving end, the acknowledgement that somebody else is making merit and you should take joy in that. So it's an invitation then to celebrate in somebody else's sympathetic joys. So when I talk with um, gong makers and gong um, and bell makers and distributors, most of all of their gongs and bells seem to go into the religious um, community. And they're quick to sort of highlight these uh, Brahma Viharas, these states of divine consciousness. 
um, that are there's many many meditation practices as well that cu cultivate these ideas of metta or mudita um, two of the four here and in these cases they're explicitly linking it with sound For the listener, the receiver of the sound, the struck bell is an invitation to mudita, to celebrate somebody else's success in the state of sympathetic joy. Metta and mudita are two of the Brahma Viharas, the ideal states of consciousness to which the goal of many meditation exercises and the ideal home for our minds. I visited Myanmar in the summer of 2019, a few months before the pandemic shut down global travel. For musicians and, and music researchers, the month of months of June, July, and August are the worst times to visit Myanmar. Um, musical troops are dormant. The wet season is historically a time for people to retreat to the monasteries. Monsoon rains historically make travel more difficult. Theater troops are not performing. And even the tourist shows in hotels and small theaters are curtailed or closed. These are, you know, this is essentially Buddhist Lent. While musical activity is on hiatus at the time, curiously, this is the time when people are expected to be more devoutly Buddhist. It's a time when the audibility of Buddhism increases. Um, during the daytime, many Dhamma Yon or, or uh, small pagodas and gathering places, meditation halls, project recorded music of many types. And people will also travel around the city with their Damayon group uh, collecting donations. So here's, here's an example of a troop that is just meandering through um, Mandalay. Um, most of the live music venues and the formal musicians have shut down, but these guys are cruising through the city collecting donations for their meditation hall. Um, and in the and in the evening, um, you're going to either have more donation um, venues that are set up, such as this one at a at a crossroads that has a video screen. <laughs> Or the the largely the women that are associated with these recitation halls. Again, this is all the laity. Um, would be broadcasting their recitation of sutras out into the uh, into the evening night.
So at a time when everybody is supposed to be um, abstaining from music and devoting more time to their Buddhist practice, seems to actually be a time when things are much louder in the Buddhist world, generally speaking. All right, sorry, there we go. Um, and now a, a few words on recitation and chant. In numerous training manuals for recitation of the sutras, practitioners are encouraged to treat the sutras in a musical manner. While they are not music, one is encouraged to not ignore the repetitions. Many sutras contain repetitive passages. Read the sutta as you would a piece of music when you sing or listen to a song. You don't skip over each chorus. Likewise, when you read a sutta, you shouldn't skip over the refrains. As in music, the refrains in the suttas often contain unexpected and important variations that you don't want to miss. This allows you to play even more skillfully. Or in this translation of the Mahisatipatthana Sutta, um, it's like learning to play piano. As you get more proficient at playing, you also become sensitive in listening to ever more subtle levels of the music. Pali has no original script. And the Buddha encouraged that the Dhamma be translated into different languages. Thus, there is no significant weight to the sounds of the texts, as there would be in the Arabic Quran. But the suttas are to be sounded. Because Pali is a non-tonal language, chants in Pali may theoretically be chanted on a single tone. But in fact, this rarely happens. How does one rationalize the melody that results? Melodic inflections occur perhaps to relieve the boredom of a single pitch, to aid in memory, as force of habit, express feelings, or residual from the tonal Burmese language. As such, there are numerous melodic rhythmic phrasing intonative questions that arise when practice gets standardized. And in this case, practice around the Theravada world is highly, highly variable. And just to give you uh, your ears a sense of it. Okay, so I'd like now just to say a few words about one of the most popular recitation suttas in Myanmar that all monks would know, and perhaps most of the laity and any of you that have actually been in Myanmar probably have heard the Metta Sutta, which is the Buddha's discourse on loving kindness. This is a discourse that came when the Buddha's disciples were, were afraid and they were scared of of tree spirits. And the Buddha said, you can't confront your enemies or your fears with more with aggression. You need to send loving kindness their way. And so this base, the, the Metta Sutta is essentially a discourse that sends out loving kindness to all creatures, all living beings, all sentient beings um, in progressively widening circles. Curiously, this, the Metta Sutta was a major performative tool of the Saffron Revolution monks in 2007, who were um, largely chanting in protest to government actions in 2007, largely protesting by saying to the military dictatorships, we love you, and you know, spreading out their loving, loving kindness. And I, I, I do find this a rather beautiful way to protest, to send loving kindness and warmth and humanity and, and um, mutual support for the human project to your enemies. Um, one other project that they were doing in, um, in the performance of the 2007 revolution was this project of Patam. 
So employing Buddhist sound as a form of challenging power engages deeply held conceptions of political authority in a uniquely Burmese way. The political theater performed by the monks during the Saffron Revolution involved a subversion of the relationship between the Sangha, the order of monks, and the rulers. As monks chanted the Metta Sutta on the streets during the revolution, they also invoked one of the most powerful political weapons available to individual monks, overturning the alms bowl, or Patam Nukajana Kama. According to Patam, monks can boycott any persons engaging with behavior out of line with Buddhism or regarded as inhumane. In the economy of merit, where giving to monks accrues merit and social standing, being refused such an opportunity results in both comic and social deficit. Essentially, if you can't donate, if you're being denied don donation, then the monks are essentially saying, go to hell, uh, because you need that karma. Monks can shun these people by not accepting religious offerings from them or not helping them to perform religious ceremonies. By refusing donations, the monks negate the status and the legitimacy of their rulers and the conflict between Buddhist law and secular law is driven to the surface. This has happened several times in Burma's past, always in socially heightened moments, 2004, 1996, 1990, 1998, 1988, sorry. Images of monks with overturned alms bowls chanting the melodious and indistinguishable sounds of the Metta Sutta were some of the most powerful images that circulated globally during the uprising. Here's a, uh, so there are a couple of clips from the 2007 demonstration and everybody would recognize the sound that the monks are chanting as the Metta Sutta. On September 21st, 2007, the monks marched to the home of imprisoned Aung San Suu Kyi. During this period, she was rarely allowed to see visitors outside her gated and guarded compound in Yangon. Monks arrived at the gate of her home and again chanted the Metta Sutta. The public or the press had not seen Aung San Suu Kyi in over three years at this time. Opening her a gate, Suu Kyi acknowledged the monks and accepted the blessing of the Metta Sutta. And of course, the monks then re-inverted their alms bowl. Um, theatrically and sonically, the relationship between democracy and Buddhist law was performed. And more specifically, a relationship was articulated between the Sangha, the monks, and the one who they regarded as the appropriate leader of the country. Shortly after that, there were attempts by the government um, to ban the chanting of the Metta Sutta. Metta Sutta is like one of, if not the most popular sutta in the country. And to ban um, the Metta Sutta would, of course, be impossible. But banning sort of large gatherings where this sound has now linked pro-democracy movements to political or religious authority in the way it's actually being used. And you can imagine where I'm going with this, because in the last couple of weeks, they have been chanting the Metta Sutta. Um, although monks um, in, in the current protests that are going on are not on the forefront in the way as they were in 2007 and, of course, 1988, um, they are still present. And, of course, the Metta Sutta is the number one chosen sound um, to put into protest.
I, I would add that it's it's an interesting practice in protest to sort of pull the sounds of a previous protest into the present. So the symbolic associations um, that were made in 2007 or in 1988 or whatnot then get brought forward. So in the soundscapes of the protests going on right now, we have things that directly link to the 2007 Saffron Revolution, but also we have all of the songs that the students were using in 1988 now back on the streets again um, to sort of you know link up these 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 protests and these revolutions as if to say they're all connected both the ontological and the legal status of music in relation to religious doctrine as well as its use in practical religious behavior are highly variable across different places and times I've provided contrasting accounts from the suttas, from several abbots, and shared audio examples drawn from the world of the laity, the world of the sangha, and the pagoda. Clearly, the role of sculpted sound in Buddhist practice is ubiquitous, highly variable, and meaningful, and scholars of sound have much to offer the studies of Buddhism. Thank you. Whoops, stop my share here. Is that right? There we go. So I am happy to engage questions or start a conversation with you all. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for that presentation. And with that, again, we encourage you, if you have questions, to raise your hand. Um, that's a preferred method so that we can make this a bit more interactive, or if not, you can also put um, questions in the chat. Uh, Eric, you have your hand raised. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you, Professor Douglas. That was a great talk. I, I really appreciate the way you uh, mapped the, the multiple criteria at play in evaluating the value and appropriateness of music. Uh, from an explicitly Theravada Buddhist perspective. Um, I think actually the way you map the, the criteria is applicable to uh, most, you know, to other forms of practice and performance. For sure. And I was, and I noted, I just sort of drew out six kind of broad criteria. Um, like one is space, spatiality. <laughs> so like location and place of music. One is temporality, like the time and even duration of music. A third was sort of the content, like the semantic source material around which music is wrapped. A third was like the event. So like the social ritual performative context of music. Then there's the actors, right? Both the performers right. of music, the audience, and of course their, their intentions and attentions and how wholesome they are and then finally like the goals right purpose function benefits of the music so sure. so my question is setting aside those moments when you asked burmese buddhists about the the you know debates about music its value and appropriateness were you witness to occasions when Burmese essentially, this is kind of an ethnographic question, when they spontaneously on their own without your prodding got into these sorts of debates? And if so, do you have a sense of which of those registers of criteria they tended to reach for, right? Did you see any patterns in which ones they would reach for first or most definitively to make their arguments, whether they were successful or not even? That would be another issue, like which ones won out actually in a debate? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, to start, yeah, your, your six criteria um, are all um, appropriately attacks on the sort of Western definition of music that is about, you know, objectified sound. And that is clearly not helpful <laughs> to, to, to understanding what's going on here. So there's all these other criteria going involved. Um, when, when I've witnessed these sorts of activities or boundary crossing or transgressions or what, whatnot, um, it's 
it kind of depends again, I guess, on your, your sixth criteria, the goals. So for example, with Uko Ko's um, Dhamma Gita performance, he had to go and have multiple conversations with the head abbot of that monastery saying, I want to make a, do uh, a donation. This is what I do. This is how I do it. I, I, you know, other people are rich and they build pagodas. This is my skill and I'm a devout Buddhist and, and showing his devoutness. And one slide I didn't show you was the abbot's expectation that everybody in that room is pure of heart. Not sure how that's measured, but you know, the, 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 uh, the expectation or the conversation in that context had to do with the devotional intent. Um, but even with that, I thought it really interesting that just before the music started, all the monks disappeared. And it was just the laity. So the abbot is sort of making concessions. And there's there's other there are other senior musicians and capital M musicians in this case that were trying to push these boundaries that are not historically sanctioned and they need to negotiate with the abbots and the abbots will make some sort of concession. And and part of this is also I had lots of talks with Ukoko and others about this. They're listening to what's going on in the Tibetan world, in the Mahayana world. They're seeing these, you know, Tibetan Gyoto monks getting Grammy awards and taking Buddhism around around the world. And, you know, it's quite it's it's normal in the Mahayana world to make a donation with music. And so all of my musician friends are like, I'm a Buddhist. I'm a musician. I want to make a music. I want to make a donation. Um, and so. I would probably tip towards the the I'd have to think about this a little bit more in the other sorts of cases where this this plays out in other areas. People are doing these very musical things where they will rhetorically say this is absolutely not music. And and they'll draw the line that way. It's his religious behavior. Yes, there's pitch melodies and there's and there's um, phrasing and there's microphones and there's long melismatic intonations, um, but it's definitely not music because that's over there. So there's there's both the sort of practical on the ground negotiation and then the sort of mental dividing up into certain categories. And yeah, I'm looking for tools for standardizing how that does because it's, um, these different situations sort of reveal different things, I think. Thank you for your question. Thanks for the answer. And we see that Thamora has her hand raised. Hi, thanks so much. I, I guess I wanna ask about the dividing up um, and this sense in which Buddhists, both, both monks and the laity are, you know, watching what's going on elsewhere. Mm. Did any of them bring up a comparison with Christianity in Myanmar? Um, I mean, I know that, that Heather McLaughlin has talked about, you know, Karen musicality in particular, but, you know, sort of the, 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 the space of the church as, you know, being musical in a Western musical sense and the ways in which that translates over to pop music. And I, and I guess I'm wondering when you were talking to, to Buddhists about music, you know, did they ever, you know, sort of make a contrast or compare what, you know, what was going on in Christian context or in sort of the popular musical context as a source of corruption or temptation or like, I'm just kind of curious about, you know, the broader Burmese context. And I don't know enough about music and musicality in the Muslim traditions of Myanmar. But I feel like there's, you know, say compared to a place like like Thailand, there's just so many more potential points of contrast, especially depending on where you live. So I'm just wondering if that if that comes up at all in the kinds of conversations you were having. Not so much. I mean, certainly depending on where you live is is key. If you're in Yangon or Mandalay, you're going to be exposed to church sounds and and whatnot. But even within 
maybe not so much Mandalay. There's not as many churches in Mandalay as there is in, in Yangon. Um, but, you know, downtown Yangon, you could be at the Sule Pagoda hearing the monks uh, reciting. And then to the east, there's the, um, there's the Baptist church. And to the west, there's the Islamic mosque. And they will all be sort of sonicating at the, at the same time. Um, the fact that most musicians um, listen to a lot of Western music that originally got its foothold with missionaries and colonialism and pianos and stuff like that makes it sometimes difficult to parse where the source of that other sound is coming from. Um, yeah, it'd be an easier question maybe 50 years ago than, than now um, where everybody's, you know, got Spotify and whatnot. Um, uh, I have found in talking with Christian largely correct, well, I guess to, to Heather's work, there's also this, um, there's this ethnic divide as well, because most of the Christian musicians, um, at least in the urban centers, are going to be Karen and Chin and Kachin, um, rather than Burman. And so there's that extra, I guess, translation um that or tension or discrimination however you want to sort of characterize it that sort of interferes with with that i'm not sure if that completely answers your question but i'll have to ruminate on that one too all right for our next question martin i see your hand is raised yes thank you very much can you hear me uh yes hi martin hi how are nice you here Great to great great talk and very stimulating. Um, I'm wondering. I'm I, I'm sorry. I may I came in about five ten minutes late, and I may have missed some portion that would answer this. But um, it seems to me like the suttas have, and you made a case that they have a sense censure, censural quality. That is as not not censor, but uh, you know to uh, pr pr provide censures of, of bad behaviors or inappropriate behaviors of individuals or more than that of uh, groups. Um, and um, I'm wondering, uh, because uh, you made a, a case of, uh, you know, their relationships uh, at, at points in your talk to um, the presence of the uh, army and it's a, and one, one would think that among, amongst army members there are a certain number of Buddhists, um, and then uh, uh, just for a little uh, side side thought about this, uh, when uh, you study religion, you you all, you always have a feeling, at least thinking about Christian religion at this point, that it has its you know qualities of prescribing. Uh, 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 recommended behavior <laughs> and and uh if you're going to be a true believer if you're going to really uh, have 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 the spirit of what's going on and so i'm wondering whether there's any uh, spiritual or moral authority that uh gets invoked and really takes hold of, of people who call themselves buddhists who are amongst the military um uh who who would say you know what we're doing is wrong of course you know what I have in mind partly is you know the need to patrol people who have gained authority, like police in America, for example. Um, and uh, but um, I'm I'm wondering whether around the world, in this case in Burma, there is any real effect of of the the lessons being preached uh, or being sung uh, on on people who. Propose, pr pr uh, portend to be or pretend to be uh, Buddhist uh, amongst, say, those in control now, the military. Yeah, yeah, that is the big question of the last 70 years in Burma, isn't it? Um, how a Buddhist majority military can maintain such um, aggressive suppressing authority. And how does that relate to religions? Um, you know, I, there's been lots written on on the um, 
the codependence between the Buddhist Sangha, the order of monks, and the military. And they each need each other to sort of approve the system. Um, I, I guess since most of my most of the suttas that I evoke and most of those Jataka tales that I reference, um, yes, I've sort of looked independently, but those were usually ones that my interlocutors, my friends, my musician friends, my interviewees would tell me they're the ones that, that they would evoke. So it's on a personal level or at the sort of local level, how an individual is engaging with their action, I guess, is is where most of my conversations have happened. Um, when you scale it up to a nation state level, um, I'm not quite sure how to translate the struggles that have happened in Sri Lanka and in Burma and in Thailand and in Cambodia and in Laos. Oh, what do you know? That's all the Theravada countries. I'm not sure how to translate all of those struggles up to the state level where it's a dominant Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist majority that have chronic political problems. Um, yeah. So anybody want to help me theorize that? That's that's yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I'm not sure what role music plays in that either, ex except to say that, you know, I've certainly seen in the Thai and the Lao and the Burmese and the Sri Lankan case, the the political authorities that have, well, the political power holders that may or may not have authority using music to assert their dominance or to assert their control or to assert their nation state making projects. Well, what this what started this question, I'm sorry to keep going up, but quickly, what started the question in my mind was your um, opening, or sorry, opening when I got there, statement about the, um, uh, the place of music in a person's life or in society. I think you, you talked about objectification of it or, or, or something of that sort. And of course, we all have that in mind because uh, when we were trained as musicologists, there was a, a way of, of dis, dis, uh, disjuncting <laughs> music from social, social situations and stuff. But, um, you know, as ethnomusicologists, uh, we, uh, we tried to rejunk, <laughs> uh, you know, bring them back together again and uh, push as hard as we could to show that music was inter interwoven in the fabric of people's lives and their the society's uh, hopes and dreams and wishes and stuff. And here's, here's, a, here's an example of a, of a religious movement that one would think could, could move uh, if if there was in fact a a deep meaning to 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 the uh, and deep embeddedment of, in the uh, or moral authority as you would put it uh, uh, or spiritual authority for the society, but it, what, what I guess what you're saying is um, that uh, <laughs> it's hard to measure or it's too much on an individual level and yeah yeah and and I do think. You know, in ethnomusicology, as you know, in the last 10, 20 years, there's been this sort of sonic turn and a lot of corners of the discipline have sort of distanced themselves from the baggage of that term music, um, which becomes yeah, yeah. a little problematic as you move it into these sorts of spaces where it's not accepted by the local definitions or it doesn't um, get bounded in the same in the same way. Um, so I'm, I find sound studies and the theory, the, uh, the literature of the sound studies world, frankly, to be much more productive to get at some of these um, questions, particularly if nobody that I'm talking to is acknowledging the sound that they're making as music. They'll certainly acknowledge that the sound is important and does cultural work and, and moves mountains and spirits and selves, but um, let's just dismiss this term music that um, that has a lot of baggage, you know, and our our training is sort of part of that baggage, I guess, too. Thank you. Sure. Um, MK, do you want to go next with your question? Sure. Uh, thank you. And um, 
forgive my background noise. I have a two week old baby on my lap. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank <Yay>. you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I really um, enjoyed and appreciated your talk. And I, um, especially the questions you bring up about the ontology of music, because I think, um, so to offer something of like a historical perspective, which I'm, I can't, um, don't totally know how that would interweave with the ethnomusicological approach, but um, okay, let me organize myself. Uh, I'm on maternity leave. <laughs> um, Got all the time you want. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, for instance, when you talk about the different seados and their different approaches to music, it could be interesting for you to think about their. Um, monastic sectarian identity, um, because there are two of the sects, the Suijin and the Dwaya, who both uh, built into their specific sect um, disciplinary codes, um, e explicitly reject music, um, but they don't say what music is. So I think your question about the ontology of music is really interesting. Um, but I'm super intrigued by the Dhamma songs um, in the context of Mingun Seido's funeral, because he was a very prominent Shuijin monk. And right. in the Shuijin history, the reason for the rejection of music was partly due to an event at the turn of the 20th century when a group of monks were killed during a festival accompanying a monastic funeral. Um, and so I think that there's a really interesting historical connection to be made there. And so the idea that all the monks left the space while the music was being performed is, um, you know, pretty interesting, but that it could, you know, it could still be okay for the laity. Um, so yeah, I, I just to say that um, there's, um, you know, some really rich historical connections to be made. Thanks. Um, yeah, and um, but yeah, particularly this idea of, you know, even though music itself is sanctioned, it's not clear what counts as music in those, you know, in those disciplinary codes. Um, but one other example I'm thinking of is so I, I work on um, Thilashin in Myanmar and um, particularly with their biographies and institutional histories. And so one biography that I'm working with um, is it's sort of sub theme beyond the life of the, the nun it's speaking about is um, that her, her sort of devotional prowess was rooted in her own personal rejection of music and that she, um, that she never, um, never allowed music within her institution. Um, so, so yeah, there's, you know, some really interesting examples of this, of where, um, you know, kind of narratives where what is and isn't music is, is delved into more closely. Ah, uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for, for those tips. I was certainly aware that, you know, all these musicians that I was traveling with, with the Ukoko Dhamma songs thing, were practitioners of the Shuijin um, tradition. Um, and I knew that was a little bit more conservative with regard to music, but I didn't know any of the particular histories. Um, and, you know, certainly that video was taken early on in my field research um, when I was, you know, coming out of Western music school with much more narrow ideas of music and I was studying music and I didn't understand what this Dhamma stuff was. And then the more I studied Burmese music, capital M music, and the more I hung out there, the Buddhism stuff just kept coming up, kept coming up. It's like, actually, this is where much more of the essence is. And yet, so I'm, I might need to sort of dissolve some of my ideas of what counts as these boundaries of music or shift some of my questions or read, you know, Shuijin histories to understand music or to understand sound at least. Yeah. Thank you for that. So the next question we have is from Gabrielle. Hi, Gabrielle. Gabriel? Hey. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can call me Gabriel or Gabriel. It's your call. <laughs> all right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's my first time here. Um, I am starting my musician life, I guess, from five years on. And it's very interesting to discuss about all these points of another and a very far from me culture uh, that is Buddhism and these things. And you said something, Gavin, that start, uh, made me think about like music, because you said that uh, some people don't really consider what these monks do music. MK also brought us uh, this discussion about some of these monkeys, some of these monks don't, uh, not considering uh, what they do music as well and stuff. But here in my country, I'm from Brazil, and here we have some priests. Of course, they are uh, from different cultural uh, religions and stuff. But we have some priests who are singers here, and they consider what they do music. And it's all about really uh, about um, how can I say this? It is all about um, this. This belief they have, this belief they, that they have about God or about something else in life, you know. And so uh, my question would be, why do these people don't consider it music? Is it because uh, of the format of this music, or is it because it is all related to religion? This would be my question. Um, and I, poof, I think there's multiple answers to that. Um, First and foremost, I think is just the concern about the the sensuality of it or the attachment that it cultivates. At least that's that's the number one answer I get from monks when I ask them about what they're doing. You know the, you know that when you, you know th that uh, Dr. Ath Athaba when he was talking about even sort of elongating his voice during a sermon is a way of sort of cultivating attachment that is independent of the message or the content of what he's trying to do. And he finds if he enjoys that, or if his ego gets built up because he's given a really good sermon, <laughs> then that undermines <laughs> what he is trying to do. And um, and likewise, from the perspective of the listener who who um, is enjoying this and gets caught up in the sensual attachment. Um, you know, of course, then the lines get kind of blurry because there's a whole, you know, star system of cassette or or CDs and recordings of your favorite monk reciting your favorite suit <laughs> and and there's the oh, there's the there's sort of a a whole marketing and a whole sort of commodification of these tapes as well that that stuff got cut in this um in this paper but there's that um there's a whole industry behind these but again it's you know recitation it's not music so um yeah, I'm I'm less concerned myself with whether it's music or not, because individuals draw that line at different places for different reasons. Um, but to talk with people about why, which I guess is what your question was getting at, why is this music or why is this appropriate in this context and not in that context? And why is that sound okay or not? Or why is it okay at this time? but not at that time, in that place, but not in that place, or out of this mouth, but not out of that mouth. Um, and yeah, I can come up with some broad themes, but not any categorical black lines. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, I think there's been lots of work done in sort of Christianity and Islam on the issues of sound and the ontologies of sound. Not a whole lot in the Theravada world. And I think it works a little different in the Theravada world. All right. Thank you very much for the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we have one more question. Most likely looking at the time, it will be our last question for today. And so let me invite Andrew. 
Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay, everyone. great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Douglas. I, the overview is really great. I'm a PhD candidate in uh, University of Toronto, also studying similar issues of sound and Buddhist practice. Um, so your overview of all these different dimensions was really helpful. And nice. Look, I look forward to checking out more of your work and hearing more of your stories. And this last bit about talking about the favorites, favorite recitations and the commodification. I think those are really interesting questions as well. Um, and you, I have two questions. The first one was in regards to the recitation, I wonder, I was wondering how, or do you ask people about um, poly literacy there? So, you know, are people understanding the poly that they hear or how do they engage um, the semantic uh, content or is it just a sound? Um, so, and how is that talked about? Um, in your experience. And then I was wondering, uh, my second question was, I realize you're focusing on the, um, the orthodox uh, dimensions or orthodox aspiring, perhaps we could say. Um, and I wanted to know, do you find any overlap between these, the Buddhist spheres and um, nat worship or spirit mediums? Um, and because you had mentioned traveling with musicians, so I was thinking, are there instrumental or linguistic or actual musicians or actors or people or practices um, that move between sort of the, the, the Buddhist Orthodox world and Nat worship? Um, or are those like discrete fields um, in, in your um, experience with the people that you engage or maybe the language used um, and how do how do Buddhists sort of um, mark themselves as you know not um, partaking in you know those or how are they shared perhaps so but thank you very much sure oh, and I look forward to reading your dissertation <laughs> thank um, yes thank um, you. yeah those are two huge questions um, mm -hmm. the uh, Unanda Wanta who is the monk. Um, about 20 minutes here and away from me in Jamestown, North Carolina. Um, we were supposed to start poly recitation lessons just as COVID hit. So oh, no. I'm looking sorry. forward yeah. to getting back with him and directly confronting that first question of yours, which is mm -hmm. how does the poly issue work? Um, certainly for within the the Burmese context there there's sort of a revolving door between the laity and the monastic community um, and certainly some monks will be you know there for many many years they'll be lifers though they will be training in Pali they will be studying Pali they will be learning how to speak Pali they will be reading in the Pali for the people that are coming in temporarily they're reciting the syllables and they're expected to recite the polysyllables and the polysyllables still do the work, even though they might not understand it. So merit, at least on the level of merit, when you have a monk coming in and reciting poly to you, the karmic merit is still accrued, even if you don't understand the merit, whether you are the rec reciter or whether you are the receiver. Um, how much karmic merit, I don't know, but um, um, so that idea of the sound still having some significance, some power, even if you don't understand the text, when any of our, every other conversation is sort of highlighting the content of the text is a really interesting tension yeah. um, that I'm hoping to sort of dig into more. So yeah, um, um, but you know, there's very, um, there's a lot of people that are Buddhist monks in Burma that don't understand Pali, <laughs> um, that are expected to recite Pali. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very much part of the practice. Um, and as far as the, uh, the movement between um, the sonic worlds of say the monastery or the pagoda and the nat shrine and whatnot um, and you know maybe professional musicians 
well, for one, there is this category of the revolving door and people will be, you know, a soldier one day, a monk the next day, a civilian the next day, and then repeat the, <laughs> the sequence. Um, so these, these are almost heuristic categories that don't actually clearly map onto individual lives. Um, and certainly with, with the nat shrines, um, much of the, the, uh, the literature on that going back to Spyro and, and elsewhere have, have sort of talked about the sort of interrelationship. It's not two, two separate religions. Um, gnats are part of the mundane day-to-day -day world. They're like germs. We got to deal with them. And you know, they're, the gnats, as with all the rest of us, are caught up in samsara. And the Buddhist problem, the Buddhist issue, is sort of a big enveloping thing beyond that. So um, I'm not so sure as I would characterize it as mediating between uh, so much as elements of the same life. Most of the nat shrines that I've been to or the nat poise that I've participated in have been within the, the boundaries of the pagoda. So they're happening right there. It's all the same shared space. Um, and to be a nat practitioner and to be a Buddhist is not a contradiction. So there's, um, and maybe at the more local level of at this time or in this space, you are propitiating one rather than the other. But um, it's not so much a contradiction when I talk to people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, we will close today's lecture. Thank you so much, Professor Douglas, for your amazing presentation and also for the very interactive question and answer. And for everyone else, I invite you to join our next study lecture, which is a week from today, also at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And it will be uh, presenting Juliet Liu, who is a visiting scholar here at Cornell. And she will be presenting like China 30 years ago, Chinese discourses of development in Northern Laos. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, evening, morning, uh, whatever time zone you're calling from. And thank, thank you again, you. Professor Douglas. Thank you all very much. Thank for you. Your for your time. I really enjoyed that. Thank you.